Welcome to Tea With Mum. I'm just saying hello to you beautiful people there who'll be watching this at a later time, which will still be now, which I always find interesting. So, and all to the beautiful people that are here with me now, in this present moment. And right on cue, thank you. <laughs> so, um, Tea With Mum lectures on non-duality. Um, most of you have been here before, you've heard this, um, the spiel. Um, basically, non-dual, we can talk about anything because everything is one and everything is nothing and nothing is everything. So every possible scenario that you could imagine uh, could potentially have already been created it, just because you've imagined it. So did you create it by imagining it or did you find it and then your imagination then showed it to you? Don't know. Probably both happening at the same time. All right. So non-dual um, philosophy is the philosophy of the center. Basically everything is one, so we are all one. We're all fractals of the one, uh, having its own experience through, it, uh, uh, through these individual perceptions of, um, of this thing that we call life and, and basically attributed to the meaning that we then place upon it. So uh, there's the first plant meaning. So this is probably the, the, the key word of tonight is uh, the word meaning. And look at it. So here it comes in. Oh, feminine energy. Beautiful. <laughs> and, and this subscribes to my self-simulation theory because I just invited it into my simulation so then it occurs. Was it coming? Was it coming? Did I pick up on the information or did uh, I impact the field by uh, inviting this into these moments of now. Not too sure. Hello. <laughs> All right, so tonight we're going to talk about self-simulation hypothesis, which is based upon quantum gravity theory. Now, I have put the link of the YouTube documentary, which is three and a half hours long. It's in a little series, Bite Bits. I didn't find that out until after, that you could watch them individually. I decided to binge it. So I went, okay, cool. So I'm going to go back now and watch it again. Uh, really well put together. Lots of words that I didn't fully understand. Or lots of theories because these guys are quantum theory um, scientists and, and they're explaining this self-simulation hypothesis. Now, the reason why I found this because after the, uh, the mushroom journey, we, I th the mushroom journey itself was showing me that, um, and it was saying to me that uh, your whole life is a self-simulation. And I'm going, no, no, the ego is fighting it. No, no, no. So you've got to watch that episode because that was really wild. So coming out of that journey, coming with these realizations, what, it, what I then started to realize is that throughout the journey, there was these, these uh, significant points of information that were being placed upon my path. And... I could just easily swipe over them and go, oh yeah, this happened and that happened and that happened. But to then fully understand, well, what is a simulation? You know, do other, is, is this a concept? Is this a theory in itself? Or has this um, journey just created this for me? And I wasn't too sure. So what I found when I came out of the journey and I went into a deep meditation in, in a sense and, and every day I was going diving deep, diving deep and, and extracting information because what I was doing was going in and opening up the doors of these significant points within the journey. And each one of those doors then had its own um, information field that you could then access and then come back out and then consider well, what do I do with this stuff? This is great knowledge, great wisdom, but if I can't practically use it in the human sense then it's just you know, mental masturbation in a sense. So coming out of it and then going, what can I do with it? Then I've been able to then apply it. And then you, when you apply it, then other things start to happen, which you then start to notice and you can open those doors and then find more and more, understand the deeper realms of what reality is. Okay, because that's what we're ultimately here for is to know thyself. And while we're knowing thyself, we then start to work out that there's this construct that we call reality that seems to be around us wherever we go. And how am I impacting this reality? And how is this reality impacting me? And am I a fluid um, conduit with reality, with life, or am I separate to it? So all of these questions then come from it and with this non-dual perspective. So what I normally do is I go and find stuff, I go and do stuff. 
I integrate it, I try it, I experiment with it, and then I come back and go, hey, this is what I found. So then you don't have to watch three and a half hours and go and meditate for 16 hours and then go and try this stuff. You can go, hey, come here, listen to this, go home with the shortcuts, here's the hack, go and try it, see what happens. All right. Seemed to work for me, this is my observation. If you give it a go, see what happens for you and then you might have your own observation of it. You will definitely have your own observation of it. <laughs> you can't do anything else other than observe it. <laughs> so. Self-simulation hypothesis. So this is what I found, because I'm thinking, hey, it is, I'm, I'm, so what I do is I go in and I meditate and I write and then I come out and I go, hey, hey, and I find these really beautiful people around me. I go, this is what I found. And they go, oh, okay, that's pretty groovy. Right, that's great. And then I then go looking for what other people have found around that. So I'm trying not to create my own hypothesis of something based upon other people's hypothesis. I find my own understanding of it and it becomes my hypothesis and then I look for other people's hypothesis of something similar. And then I, what I seem to find is there's so many similarities, which would then suggest that everybody who is creating this hypothesis is picking it up from the same field of information. It's not their own unique viewpoint of it. This is my idea. I found this. I want to own it. I'm going to trademark it. I'm going to patent it. And it's mine. Well, no, there's nothing. You, all you're doing is picking up information. You're picking up information within the field of awareness, field of consciousness, each and every moment. And then you go, I've got an idea. And you know what? A thousand people around the world picked up the same idea. What they do with it, though, is their experience. Yeah. So now we then start to consider, hmm, where is this place that I can get this information? How do I get there? Is it somewhere localised or is it unlocalised? Is it internal? And if it's internal, where is it? Is it in the body? Is it hidden in the kidneys and the heart? Or is it a space that we can't actually tangibly gather but we seem to tangibly experience though? Maybe it's actually an interdimensional space. Possibly. Now, the beautiful thing is I can say possibly because of a thing called the cosmological perspective of life. So this is what I found. What's your cosmological perspective of life? So how do you look at the universe? Do you think that it just happened in the Bing Bang and everything was totally random and that we're the only um, planet in the whole of the universe has got apparently intelligent life form? And that we only have one life, we're born and we get through it and it's depending on where you're born, if you have a good life or a bad life and ultimately you die and then that's it. So see how that's a cosmology. Now your cosmology, in a sense your world view or your cosmological view, will ultimately determine what is possible for you. Now this is really powerful because that means one thought can totally change your life. <laughs> what's that one thought? I don't know. All right, so what's your cosmology? If you have a cosmology that includes quantum physics, which has been proven, might I say, mathematically proven and through experiments, if you invite quantum physics as your cos part of your cosmology, you will then realise that there is an infinite number of possibilities that exist within the quantum field. Now, that means anything can happen. Anything can happen. It opens up everything and nothing. See how by attaching that or inserting that into your cosmological view, you then create full access to whatever it is that you want. Now, once you step into the world of possibility, then your intentions and your thoughts can drive that possibility to then be manifest within your experience. Okay. Now, these guys have a concept called, it's a self-simulation hypothesis. Now, there's parts of this that I agree with this and I go, yeah, I resonate with that. There's other parts where I think, man, you're just trying to, you're grasping at something 
to to create a beautiful hypothesis, however, I, I like my hypothesis of what I'm connecting to. So what these guys are saying, this is based upon quantum gravity theory. All right. Now, ultimately, they're sort of saying that you create your own reality by your thoughts and your emotions. Same as the law of attraction, same as the art of manifesting. All right. So this is a quantum theory perspective of it. However, their hypothesis is based upon possibilities occurring and what's actually occurring within our world at the moment where we have AI um, learning at a phenomenal rate. We have the evolution of the human, human species. We have the evolution of technology. Um, we, have, uh, we have evidence of aliens um, visiting our shores, our Earth. Um, and so with all of that, then there is the suggestion that we as a species will continue to evolve into a future which has spacecraft, aliens, AI and technology and ourselves. So see how we're sort of, in a sense, what these guys are saying is that our future is headed in a particular direction. There's the possibility of that happening. With the possibility of that happening, what they're also suggesting is that at some point in the future, so our descendants, who will look at us as ancestors, will be inquiring into what were those guys doing at that particular time? What was happening at that time? And they will have created, we've already created quantum um, computers and the way that AI works. They will be able to have the technology to create a simulation of an experience of what their ancestors experienced. And they will be able to sit whatever it is in a, you know, a, a dome or they could have a VR set and they could actually be experiencing you. So you are their ancestor, you're their 14th generational ancestor. And they're going, oh man, what was happening with Caleb around that time? Why don't we step in to this simulation that was reflective of his experience because we have the technology. So this is where they're sort of going. Now you can go, okay, that's a possibility. So they're trying to create a possibility for this self-simulation to, to be occurring. So ultimately, all of us sitting here now, thinking that we're sitting here talking to ourselves in this lifetime, we could be our descendants experiencing ourselves in what we did when we were happening around this time. This is their hypothesis. I can see that how that could occur. I'm more so concerned about how am I making my own reality? Yeah? Is this a self-simulated experience that maybe others are also having their own self-simulated experience, but we're joining together and we're meeting in the quantum with the field of possibility and then we interact with each other? Yeah? Hence, um, and just to give you some context, before you lovely ladies arrived, it was just boys and this one. <laughs> and I said, there's a lot of masculine energy here. But you know what? I feel as though there's going to be some feminine energy all of a sudden dropping in very soon. And then you stepped in. <laughs> and I didn't set that up. Okay. All right. So... Self-simulation hypothesis based on quantum gravity theory, which I'm not going to go into too complex. What it comes back to, though, and this is what I found really interesting, was that um, uh, the way that reality was defined was um, two spaces. Uh, one, uh, reality was, was made up of energy and matter. Right? So that was how physicists were, um, were relating to reality. We then found with um, Albert Einstein and E equals MC squared that matter is actually a form of energy. So you can neither create nor destroy energy, you can only transform it. Yep. So then reality equaled energy. Now, that's all well and good in saying, but energy wasn't really quantifiable. You couldn't, it wasn't really specific in a, in a sense. So what they then did was that they, they replaced um, rather than, so from a, from a quantum mechanics perspective, reality is energy. From a, um, from a quantum gravity theory perspective, reality is information. Can you repeat 
Okay, so, from, from, so there's different levels of quantum uh, theories. So quantum mechanics, which was what was founded by um, Max Planck, I think it was, it's, it derived that reality was energy. So it's energy in flux, energy that changes and it, um, it molds and adapts to something. And they were using the observer effect on that. So, you know, a, um, a photon of light usually travels in a waveform. However, when someone was watching it and they did the double split experiment, if it was observed, that waveform would become either a particle or a wave. So depending on the observer, it then impacted light. And see, light seems to be the one thing that's constant in this universe that we can sort of, that we feel comfortable enough in saying the speed of light, we can measure things to it. And we seem to see it everywhere. You know, light, light is important for the, for the universe. So it's a, it's a good base to start with. So the observer effect in the split experiment. So what that suggested then was that once you observe something, you can impact what the outcome of it is. And this is why intention is really important because when we place an intention on something, what we're actually doing is we're shifting energy, we're shifting uh, the, the quantum into towards what our intention is. Yeah. So if we're not uh, consciously intentional, we then become unconsciously uh, in survival mode. So see how our survival mode, all the negative thoughts, the fear-based thoughts that we have, that, in a sense, is impacting the reality that is then placed upon your path. And then you can, because we're always constantly looking for evidence to say that we're right. See, I told you I was right. Lucky I stayed away from that. I told you I was right. Yeah. So um, remember, Henry Ford said, whether you believe you're right or you're wrong, you're always right, because you're going to prove yourself right or wrong. Yeah. You're going to find evidence to prove that anyway, and you'll dismiss evidence of the contrary. So see how the, the observer effect is actually impacting things. So... If that's the case, which it is the case, then it's important to be aware of, well, how am I observing something? Because you observe it in a particular way. The way that you observe it isn't just constant and shifts and changes. Yeah. Am I aware of the way I'm, observe I'm observing it? Or is this a subconscious, unconscious, habitual experience that I'm having that I'm totally unaware of? You know, neuroscience is saying we have, we, we have between 70,000 and 80,000 thoughts per day. We're only aware of about 5% of them. And they only really come online because they're quite controversial. Oh, now I'm aware of that thought. Well, you've got a shitload of thoughts constantly in the background. Yeah. You know, w on average, we, we breathe 22,000 times per day. You've got four times as many thoughts as you are breathing. You can't catch them all. Those thoughts can be creating a reality. When we look at it from a parts perspective with internal family systems, am I creating from a parts, which is based on fear, or am I creating from self, which is or I'm already safe? See how they're impacting? There's different relationships there, which is moving into where I'm going. So reality is information. Now, I've been banging on about breath work and going into meditation and altering your brainwave state so you can access the information that's relative to the brainwave state. Reality is information. Algorithms are information. AI gets its learning from information. You learn from information. So reality is information. Even if you want to look at it from the matrix perspectives, it's all ones and zeros. It's information. Yeah. So reality is information. Information creates meaning. Meaning is what consciousness does. So consciousness gives meaning to something. If you are a species of vehicle that is attributing meaning to something, from this theory, they are suggesting that you have consciousness. You are conscious because you're attributing meaning to something. Do you know what that means to actually attribute meaning to something? You, your brain has to be so highly evolved and abstract within itself that it can, it can come to the awareness of itself. That is huge. You know, we as the human species are so well placed within the whole cosmos 
because we have enough technology to understand quantum physics and prove it. Right? So we're going right into the quantum. This is how far we can go. We can go right into this, and then we can go string theory all the way out to oneness, that there could be a creator that is everything that is within this universe, and there's multi-universes. So look how far our brain can expand just within its thought process. That's fucking huge, man. Absolutely huge. And all of that that exists within that, your mind could actually comprehend. So all of this information, information is meaning. Meaning is what consciousness does. So it's interesting because then they placed it into this context where consciousness is the noun, thing, person, people, place, right? And meaning is the verb. It's an action word. So meaning is what consciousness does. So I'm suggesting that you are all consciousness, you are all conscious, and you are placing meaning upon the information that's coming into you from your reality. Yeah. So then I went even further to then go, right, that's really interesting. Now, the other thing here too is that I was having this conversation, might have been last night, and maybe Ali, I spoke to you about this, that um, you know, with the intergenerational trauma, so we're looking at what, up to 14 generations that back? We know that we know of. Up to 14 generations back, will, um, that intergenerational trauma will be information held within your DNA that gets passed through. So a lot of the shit that you're going through at the moment, it's not yours. It's actually your ancestors. Fucking ancestors. I thought that was mine. How come I got it? Yeah? So probably about 70% is actually your ancestral stuff, 30% is yours. A lot of us have come onto this planet at this particular time with this awareness, with these beautiful, loving, open hearts to clear the ancestral trauma because you will be able to hold it. Right. Now, consider this. We're good at going back in time, 14 generations. Whatever you are imprinting in your code now is what you are sharing with your descendants for the next 14 generations. Now, we can heal the last 14 generations here now. We've got the capacity to do that because we understand it. From that generational healing, we will create generational wisdom. So we then get to shift trauma into healing, into wisdom, and then we encode that within our information, within our DNA, for our descendants. So see how pivotal you are in these moments, right here, right now, in this thing called your lifetime. We have so much capacity to heal not only the past, but to create create future generations. These conversations that we're having now, that you're listening to, you're observing this, you're having an experience. Right? Because remember too, time from a non-dual perspective is both linear and simultaneous. The information that you're receiving now, you are coding into the future. Each and every moment is the moment of power. Really important, okay? So good to be aware of what is the meaning that I'm placing upon things. And more so, what is the relationship? So let's go to relationship. Life is relational, okay? Classic teachings. The Buddha spoke about this. Uh, he said that uh, every moment is in, independent of itself and yet interdependent of the one that came before it and the one that follows after it, yeah? It's this beautiful flow. So it's all relational. Who has the relation? The one that is observing, the point that observes. You all have points that you're observing from. Now you are creating a relationship with whatever it is that you're observing in each and every moment. Yeah. So life is relational, self and others. Right? Important. Where there is an observer, there is something that's being observed. So. 
in each and every moment, you're not only observing something, but you're also being observed. And what are you being observed by? Maybe others, but the bigger picture, life. Because it's always there. And even when it's not, there'll be something that's observing you. So see how we're, we're both. We're being observed and we're observing. Now, as we observe something, we then place meaning on it. So... Observer, observed, meaning is given to the relationship of what I'm observing. So now we've got meaning is given to the relationship. Now, this is where I then go into, right, what have we been doing around the law of attraction and manifesting and stuff like that? Then I then started to consider, does meaning have a frequency? What is meaning? Like, how do you define meaning? What, what, What's the meaning that I give to this and give to that? So it was interesting. I had a, a beautiful conversation in one of my sessions um, just recently. And what this person was saying was that um, they were hoping that they would present their partner with something which they knew. Well, they had an idea of what was happening, but they were presenting this situation to the partner so the partner would tell the truth. Yeah. But because the partner wasn't telling the truth, because the parts had been activated and there was too much, you know, there wasn't enough safety to tell the truth, the partner would then lie. So because the partner lied, then the one who was asking for the truth felt disrespected. So see the meaning there? So what that meant was, and I said, well, what, what, what do you want? I just want that person to tell the truth. And if they tell the truth, then how, what does that mean to you? Then that means I'm respected. Right. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that when you work out what the meaning is, you could then s sort of feel into, is there a frequency of being respected? I'm sure there probably is. You know, maybe, and you could probably even break that down further. Well, if I'm respected, then I'm seen. Uh, if I'm respected, uh, I matter. Yeah, uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm considered. Or maybe I'm loved. So see how they're, they're, they're quite... Uh, and I, I was sort of taking it back to like a positive cognition. Yeah, it's that I am statement. So this is where I'm thinking that meaning's going. I'm not fully understanding of this this is something that i you know, i'm trying to in a sense and, and through and maybe after this we can have some comments around it so if if consciousness places meaning on information which is our reality and then from that meaning then something is created from that you know that is the intention that is the thought that is the observation how, which changes um you know uh, light into particular things then does meaning have a frequency and so if I could then start to tap in and question and inquire into what is the meaning that I'm giving to this? Because each and every one of you today would have possibly had an experience. Well, here we go. You, each one of you today would, would have had an experience that was either positive or negative that you attributed meaning to. It's a pretty broad statement, but it sort of covers everything. So maybe in these moments, just consider what, what's happened for me today or you could say, what happened to me? See how, depending on what meaning you place upon it? Oh, that happened to me, fuck. You know, like, oh. You know, it's like... But it's because, so tonight, uh, no one had booked for tea with Mo. And it was interesting because my parts were going, oh, no one's coming. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> so thank you for that context. Um, and then... Then I was able to, so, so notice that part had placed meaning on it, yeah, that, oh, no one's interested anymore, oh, I'm in trouble, oh, yeah, it's, it's my fault. So, so those parts had created this you know, dialogue there. And then there was this self-energy coming in and going, hey, Mo, it's okay, you know, hey, little Mo, it's okay. Um, <laughs> not many people book for it, and we still get people turning up. So just trust in the process. So see how that, that part of self had a different meaning. So see how we've got these interplaying meanings that are happening. And notice that there could be a frequency with those, and there definitely was a frequency. I could feel that. I was like, oh, no, rather than go, hey, it's okay. 
even when I'm talking about it, there's different um, um, pitch and frequency within the words. So let's, you know, because this is a hypothesis, let's suggest that there could be a frequency related to the meaning that you could sort of derive. Now, once again, self-inquiry is going to help with this. Mindfulness is going to help with this. Reflective practice, introspection, all is going to help with this. Okay. So meaning could have a frequency. So then I was thinking, why don't we just go to the frequency of the meaning of what we're placing upon things and we manifest from the meaning. Rather than, so for that person that I was talking about, rather than them going to their partner, trying to extract the truth out of the partner so then they could feel respected, what about if you just, through meditation, through visualisation, went into the frequency of feeling respected, feeling loved, feeling seen, feeling adequate, you know, feeling considered. And then allow life to then place experiences upon your path that are reflective of it, rather than trying to change other people so you can then feel something. See, there's a lot of, I'm, I'm going externally so I can feel something internally rather than going, what about if I just went internally and because I'm connected to life and if this is a self-simulation theory, then what life can do is place things upon my path that are reflective of what my frequency is. That sounds pretty groovy. Yeah. And it doesn't take long to do that. You know, but what it does take, it takes your imagination. And it takes this question because, you know, we've had a couple of conversations. Um, you know, uh, the question is, uh, who am I? U ultimately, who am I? All right. So if I take away all of these roles and all of these things that I'm doing, you know, that have kept me safe and you know, kept me connected, all that sort of stuff, um, why would I get let go of them? Because ultimately, I'd be left with, I don't know who I am. And so then the question was, well, rather than questioning who I am, then you could consider, well, who do I want to become? Just give it a go. Now, even that question can be quite activating for people because Marie, I've never really, I, I don't know who I want to become. I don't know who I am. You go, oh, well, try it on. <laughs> give it a go. Because it's a muscle. It's a muscle that hasn't been used. It's a question that hasn't been asked. It's, a, it's something that hasn't been explored or even considered or contemplated or meditated. So why not ask these questions? Because who knows the possibility that will unfold from it as well. So frequency is expressed into reality via meaning. Frequency is expressed into reality via meaning. So basically, what's the frequency of meaning? I'm going to express it into my reality. And this is where, you know, this beautiful this beautiful information that came to me many, many years ago, life can only give to you that which you already are. I'll say that again. Life can only give to you that which you already are. So life cannot give you a frequency that you are not. It's a frequency match. It's a resonance. Everything that's placed upon your path is reflective of what exists within you. That's the self-simulation hypothesis. Uh, so above as below, you know, your external reality is a reflection of your internal state of being. The lo uh, world is a mirror. You know, there's so many words that are, that are said in that way. And then the final question that I want to leave you with is, what is your relationship with life? So remember, relationship will have a meaning. So what's ultimately your relationship with life? Because we can have relationships with others and we can sort of segment them and go, that's an individual person and they've got these traits and I either like them or love them or hate them or get need to get rid of them. But, you know, I don't, I can, I can ignore them and get out of their way. I can, you know, go the opposite way and try and not to see them. But you know what? You can't get away from life. So one of the greatest questions is what is the relationship that you have with yourself and what is the relationship that you have with life because every other fucker is part of life and that's how it then comes <laughs> and that is that i think we did that in pretty good record time 
Um, I will say goodbye to everybody watching uh, online here um, and thank you. Uh, really interested in any comments that you have around this. I'm just going to hang out with these beautiful people that are in here as well too.